بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد رحمة للعالمين على آله وصحبه أجمعين. We praise Allah who Subhanahu wa Taala. We beseech Him to send His peace and blessings upon our Master Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم upon his companions, his family, and those who follow him, and his Ummah al-Musharrafah حتى تقوم الساعة till the end of time. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. MashaAllah, may Allah reward you for your excellent patience. You know, Anas ibn Madik said that the companions would listen to the talks of the prophets like scarecrows. And there have been a number of talks here, all of them, absolutely, this is the first time I've heard uh, Sheikh Omar before in person. It's absolutely, mashallah, incredible, invigorating speaker. Uh, Yasha Qadi and I, we're from the old school, I guess now, it sounds weird, we're the old somethings. And then, of course, uh, our friend the Doktor, uh, also we go to the same old school pond. So I'm sure you're very tired. And, and that's not to say that the talks weren't good, but there is certainly a bandwidth in everyone's brain. The server from my website actually crashed today, which is a perfect segue for this. So what I plan to do is to take this as short as possible. There is some great chicken tikka back there, uh, some wonderful gulab jamans, you know, Hey, I know a man once who ate 36 gulab jamans in 15 minutes. College. And, and those of you who don't know what gulab jamun is, it's basically a pancake rolled up in a ball, dipped in syrup for like 10, 15 years, and then <laughs> eaten. That's a gulab jamun. You can actually take shots with them, halal shots, with gulab jamuns. I'm doing that on purpose just to relax you because you have been listening attentively for a very long time. And you know, khayru karam ma'aqalla wa adal. The best speech is what's quick and to the point. So what I plan to do is just touch on this issue and then hopefully we can take a, breath, a breather because there's a lot of talks, incredible speakers, and we want to be able always to be refreshed, you know. When, you know, one of our teachers told us that it's from the sign that you're, subhanAllah, that you're shaka to Allah, that you're thankful to Allah, that when you listen to a speaker, you're attentive because you're listening to someone who's reflecting the Prophet back to you. And that's why the Prophet said that my example compared to the scholars is like the moon compared to the scars, the stars. And Al-Qarafi Al-Mariki said because the, the Shams is the Prophet, that the sun is the Prophet, and the moons are the Ulama, and the Kawakib are the Awam, that the, the, the sun is the Prophet, the moons are the scholars who reflect his light back to the masses who are the stars. MashaAllah. So you're the stars of the ummah. MashaAllah. So what I've been asked to talk about is I tried it and it didn't work. There could be a number of meanings surrounding that zahir in usul. This would be a jumla which is kidden zahir or mujmal. And it's up to me now to try to figure out what our brothers at YM meant and sisters with the best possible assumptions. So what I've done is kind of gone retro and thought about how, how I would have thought about that, say, a few years back. Number one, it could be that I'm thinking to do some haram. Or I'm thinking, as one young Muslim said to me, is the grass greener on the other side, Imam? I was asked this question once with Sister Yasmin binti Bobo. We were doing a camp together, and a young Muslim raised her hand and said, she said, is the grass greener on the other side? So then I asked her, what do you mean by is the grass greener on the other side? And she said, well, you were lucky, you were a Kafir before. That was a total trip right there. And, and I, I was kind of shocked by her question. And then Sister Yasmin was able to answer her. So if that's the, the question here is trying it, you know, and it didn't work, you know, I experimented with some evil and it didn't play out. Let me just answer that question quickly and then we'll move on. That the only reason a person would want to try something on the other side is because they are not finding pleasure with Allah. As one of our teachers, Al-Alama, Dr. Ali Juma, when we were reading the Ihya of Imam Al-Ghazali and Masjid Al-Azhar al-Sharif, when we reach the chapter on sujood, and it's interesting you mentioned Sheikh Abdul Hamid Kishk, who was the Sheikh of my Sheikh in Balagha, who said, Rahimahullah, that if someone has truly made sujood to Allah and tasted the sweetness of sujood, 
they will never make sujood to anything but Him, subhanahu. And we should understand this, that any time we find a desire to move towards something that's going to take us away from Allah or take us away from His pleasure, then that is rooted in a love for dunya. And Imam Ibn Taymiyyah said that zuhd is of two kinds. He said number one is being zuhd from the dunya. And he said, وَهَذَا الْمَحْمُودِ And this is commendable without any doubt. And he said, but there are others who are zuhd from the akhirah. Those who their hearts, and the word zuhd means two things. It's mistranslated in Arabic into English because we have this star, case, star Trek issue of translating everything. We, dra we drain the emotions out of translation. So, you know, when the Prophet said, someone says to him, you know, I would love to sacrifice myself for you. We translate it in a way that's kind of nice and pretty. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the brothers of Yusuf after they sold him and after he was captured, excuse me, and sold that he was sold a very cheap, cheap price and then they were free of him. They didn't have to worry about him anymore. So the ulama said that a zuhd means two things. A rida, to be pleased and secondly, to be indifferent to the object. Because the zahid is the subject, its object, him or her leaving it, has brought a sense of pleasure and a sense of a lack of responsibility. So he said, there are some people who will have zuhd in the akhirah, nas Allah ta'ala bil afiyah, who will be pleased not to work for the hereafter and be indifferent to the concerns of the hereafter. And these are the people who will find themselves asking the question, is the grass greener on the other side? Is the grass greener on the other side? And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that thalatha, three people, three types of people have tasted the sweetness of faith. And one of them is that they would hate to return to kufr. And that they love Allah and His Messenger more than anything else. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that's why the Sufis, they call this maqam al -dhawq. Because of the hadith of the Prophet found in Sahih Muslim who said, Man ta'ma al iman, who tasted the sweetness of faith. So faith has a sweetness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this to the Sahaba when he mentioned his na'mah upon them in Surah Hujurat when he said, Subhana wa ta'ala wa'lamu anna fikum Rasul Allah. Know that amongst you is the Messenger of Allah. And then later on, talking about faith, he said, وَحَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُقَ وَالْعِسْيَانِ Allah said that he beautified, ornamented faith in your hearts and made it beloved to you and made disbelief and sin and rancor and evil something that you would despise. So the ulama said that the sign of healthy faith is that a person is zahid from the haram. They are indifferent to it and they are pleased to be away from it. And this could come from two things as Imam Ibn Qayyim mentioned. Number one is a mistake in knowledge. Not understanding really what is the haram. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah A'raf, He says, يُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ that what the Prophet has made forbidden to them is in itself bidatihi, something which is disgusting and filthy. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the halal, He says what? Tayyibat. Kulu min al-tayyibati ma razaqnakum. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, alayhi salam, inna Allah ta'ala tayyib, la yaqbaru ila tayyiba. That Allah is good and He only accepts what's good. So it could be a mistaken uh, uh, understanding related to what we call al-ma'arif, al-ma'rifah, how they understand reality. And let's be honest, this is where shaitan plays. Shaitan is one of the greatest false salesmen ever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam, la taqraba hadihi shajara. Don't come close, you and your wife, to this tree. Saddu dhara'i and usul that some things can become haram because they themselves will lead to haram. This tells you the danger of haram. 
That's why the Amalekites, we say that if you know a man makes wine, this is of course in the old days before factories that we have now, that if you know a man, he makes wine and you sell grapes, it's forbidden for you to sell grapes to him because of the probability that he will use those grapes for something forbidden. We take that from the principle, don't come close to the tree. Even though coming close to the tree is not in itself forbidden, it can lead to what's forbidden. And we take an incredible axiom from this that Al-Baydawi mentioned the Minhaj. Al-Wasailuhu, Al-Wasail laha ahkam al-Maqasid. That means take on the rules of their objectives. So in order to emphasize the great evil of haram, at times Allah even makes the means to the haram forbidden to protect you from it. And that's why when the man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as related by Imam Abu Dawud, he said, can I kiss my wife in Ramadan? Not you. Because even though it's allowed, you got issues B. And we know what those issues are. But another man came to me and said, no problem, because he was a little old. It takes a while to get the engine going. But the means change according to their maqasi. So number one could be a mistaken understanding of halal and haram. And this is where shaitan, as Allah says, zuyina li nas. He beautifies things for people. Imam ibn al-Qayyim said the first person, or first, excuse me, creation to be guilty of false advertisement is Iblis. The FDA will be after him now. Because Allah said to them, don't come close to the tree. You'll be zalimeen. But in the seventh chapter of the Quran, what does he say to them? وَمَا نَهَاكُمُ رَبُّكُمْ عَنْ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَكُونَ مَلَكَيْنِ أَوْ تَكُونَ مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ He comes to them and he says, the only reason your Lord told you to stay away from the tree is because if you eat from it, you will live forever or become angels. He switches the rhetoric. That's why Islamic schools are so important for our children. Because it creates an environmental rhetoric where norms are established. Iblis tries to change social norms. He read the tipping point. And he understands that I can make people who should be upright succumb to pressures, whether internally or externally, and obey me. And that's why one of the mechanisms he uses is fear. And Maslow talked about, talked about this in his hierarchy of needs. The first need that any human being has is not to be scared. And that's why the prophet is a mean. You can bank on him like the Celtics tonight. Got you. Make sure you're awake. At 8 o'clock, I will not be around. Don't try to find me. Right. Say inshallah. C76 is never say inshallah. We're going to win. You make hasad all on your team. I say Celtics, insha'Allah, bi'ithnillah. But shaitan, he plays. Got more game than Parker Brothers. And Allah says, إِنَّمَا ذَارِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَ Allah says, shaitan tries to scare you. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُ مُخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Don't fear them, fear me. Because fear is a powerful thing. FDR said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So he comes at us from different means, emotions, and knowledge. But our point now is knowledge. And not only did he tell them, the tree will cause you to live forever, you'll become angels, yo. He said, This is the first example in history of peer pressure. Everyone said, you know, Gardner in his theories of knowledge talked about peer pressure. I heard this in the College of Education when I was there in Oklahoma. I said, no. Allah talked about the peer pressure that shaitan used on Adam and his wife. Because you usually notice something, that when shaitan speaks in the Quran, he speaks in a plural. We. But it's who? وَقَاسَمُهُمَا He swore to them, إِنِّي لَكُمْ لَمِنْ لَسْ نَاصِحُونَ أَمِينَ لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ as if to say, I am to you. There's a lot of people who know the tree can do this for you, man. But I got your back. I'm the one who loves you. I'm the one who cares about you. So I'm out of all the people who know the secret, right? A la Martha Stewart style. I'm the one who's going to come and tell you if you eat it, this is what will happen. But everyone knows that, but you too. This is the first example parents and young people and us of peer pressure.
in history. So his main goal is fasad al ma'arif. It's to change the understandings that people have about things. So the halal becomes haram and the haram becomes halal. So the akhirah becomes what we are zahideen from. And the dunya becomes something that we are embedded in. And that's the first area of knowledge. Number two is desires. That shaitan comes to the people simply from their desires. We have desires. We are a people who have in them desires. And Allah says very clearly in the Quran, وَالنَّجَمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُحَى And watch this, this is incredible. Hold on to your kufi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the star as it hawa. Hawa means to drop low. It's from the same word as hawa, desires, because the Arab said whoever follows his desire will be brought low. But what's interesting is that the, Allah is talking about Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what he says next is that he's not dal and he's not ghawa. Dal is related to fasad al-ilm. Being astray is related to a corruption of what? Understanding, knowledge, the first problem. But ghawa is related to someone who's overcome by their base desires. Someone who allows themselves to obey their desires. And they become like al-an'am. We ask Allah bil afia. So that's the first reason. Or the first understanding. That maybe I'm going to try it because I just think for that one moment. That split moment when I'm hollering at super bass. That at that one moment. The reality that we should ask ourselves at that moment. If we're looking at pornography, if we're smoking some weed, if we're about to pop our wife upside her head, like we're Mayweather in, Mayweather in the ninth round, I'm about to throw some biryani at my man because I'm upset. Have some dow. Dow. Right? All of those type of actions or evil in the heart to feel jealous of others, all of that is rooted in the absence of the love of Allah. Because if we see anyone doing good and we love Allah, we'll be happy. Because we love Allah more than we love ourselves. And if I find myself at that moment in time, believing for that one split second that the haram is better for me than what's with Allah, that means at that moment, at that second, at that instant, at that breath, I love it more than Allah. And that's messed up. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said that the one, al-mu'min, who commits zina, is not a believer why he commits zina. And why he steals, he's not a believer. Because at that moment, complete faith cannot be there. Water and oil don't mix. The second meaning that could be, you know, I tried it and I, it didn't work, is that I've been worshiping Allah for a long time and I just haven't had that high. You know, I see you know, great imams and shuch, and I have friends and converts. These converts, converts are always so high, man, on Allah. Not smoking no primos. We smoking 20 rakat. So high all the time. I don't understand it. I worship Allah 24-7, and I just feel horrible. Number one, Imam Ibn Ta'a al-Askandari said, whoever worshiped Allah for a feeling is a fool. Whoever worshipped Allah for a feeling is not truly worshipping Allah. They're worshipping the feeling. But the highest station is to worship Allah because he's Allah. And to derive pleasure in that. My son once, I took my son to Giza in Masr. Where the pyramids are. To ride horses. And my son was scared to ride horses. He's seven years old. Right? But finally, he got up enough, you know, fortitude. He didn't ride a camel. He said, you going to ride a camel? Dang, you went from the horse to the camel? You sure? He said, Baba, I'm going to ride a camel. Arkab al He said, ماشي الحال فضل يا مولانا. So he rode the camel. I didn't ride a camel for obvious reasons. I mean, the camel don't like each other. My, bro my son who I call my brother, because he's also my brother in Islam as well as my son. When he came back, he was on his camel and he was euphoric. 
He was saying, Dad, look at me. Look at me. I was like, dude, you're riding the camels. You know how we are. Right? But then I realized in his mind he had fulfilled what he defined as being my son. He had fulfilled that purpose. And that meant everything to him. When that hit me, be tawfiqi la, alhamdulillah, I stood up, I was like, Masha Allah, hadha ibni. Da walid, Masha Allah, da shama. Right? I started praising him, making him feel like, yeah, you did it. Then what if that's the pleasure of a non mukallaf young boy at fulfilling the pleasure of his father, what he believes his father wants from him? What do we say about those of us who fulfill the orders of our Lord to worship him? And that's why Ghalib said, Zindigi be bandigi shamindigi. Watch out. That's the only one I know I've been saying it for 10 years. <laughs> but it's a beautiful verse. I know the only yaqeen mahkam amal payham, but we're not going to read that here. We'll get in trouble. But first and foremost, it's not about worshiping Allah for a high. It's worshiping Allah because he's Allah. And that deals with ma'rifah. And here's where we need to get a little serious. The concept of ma'rifah is unique to Islam and even the concept of knowledge that the Qur'an deals with. And that's why I feel sometimes Islamic schools should not simply, you know, regurgitate what we've learned. I went to the College of Education, but also we should start to synthesize our own theories about the mind and the heart and the fitrah. And come with our theories for teaching our young people. That means we have to put money into our institutions, not only to teach, but to investigate and research. But we have something called ma'rifah. And the word ma'rifah comes from a word which means to smell. Arfa nashir. Arf. Arf means. And actually it comes from a word which means something that you see. It's very clear. That's why it's called surat wat a'raf. And that's why a custom in usul al-urf. Al-urf muhkam. Because it's something that a custom becomes clear in a society. Everyone is doing it. So it's called urf from the same word. Something that's marfu'a. Imma hissan aw ma'nawiyan. So we say that ma'rifa is related to something that you smell. Because if you wake up in the morning and you know that you want your wife to drop the paratas. I know about paratas, man. Whew. I'd stay off that. And you begin to, man, is that a parata? Is that the parata with the meat inside and the potato? And you begin to smell and sniff. And after a while, you come to what the scholars of Mantiq call what? A tasdiq. And tatakum ala shay. That you come to an affirmation of that. Either takdeeb or tasdiq. So you're like, bam, she hooked it up. Or vice versa. You wake up. Is that boiling water? Is that dude putty? That's all we can make is dude putty, man. And I still get the milk everywhere. I don't know how they do that. But that process of, that's called arf. And it leads to a natija. The natija, the outcome is called ma'rifah. So Allah in the Quran illustrates two ways that people will come to ma'rifah. And Imam al-Razi in Mafatih al-Ghayb he says that there are two ways, and this is also mentioned by Imam Ibn Taymiyyah in Majmu'ah Fatawa. I know I always have to mention two scholars from two camps because I know how it rolls, because we still had this problem. May Allah give us yani fahm, shamil, kamil. But Imam Al Razi said, number one, and this is deep, watch this, this is incredible, that number one, it could come by you knowing creation, that you would see the bounties of God in this canvas of his that he's created, and by seeing those bounties, you would come to know him. And he said, jayyid, That this is a great state. We find that in the Quran, يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقَتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَ سُبْحَانَكَ وَقِينَ عَذَابَ النَّارِ And that method is found in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they 
burden themselves to think about the creations of the heavens and the earth and they say our Lord. So they come to this conclusion that the existence has a sana, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why in Surah Al-Kawthar we find this pattern in the Quran many places. Allah mentions to the Prophet first, Akramna bihad al kawthar we gave you this incredible amount of good from Fawal. And because of this ni'mah that you see, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in front of you, Fasalli li Rabbik. And here he didn't say Fashkur Rabbak. He said Fasalli, pray, because shukr is based on cognition the tongue and the limbs and the best way to do that is in salah and that's why he said salah as if to say that shukr as an am the best aspect of shukr you can do is pray one har and for those of us who are converts one har is an a, 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 a verse which encourages us to be financially stable so that we can actually make udhiyah on our own so after seeing the bounties of Allah, the Prophet is ordered to worship. The other method of ma'rifah is that the person knows Allah and then knows the creation. Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budani. And this is the maqam of Umar. Allah said, I am Allah. And Umar said, you're right. He didn't need to go through any other means. But if you look in the Quran, you'll see this pattern over and over again. Surah so Rahman is the first method. Surah so Fatiha also. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allah is Rabb. Ar Rahman Ar Rahim. The most gracious, merciful, provided everything for you. Madi Kiyom Medun, who's going to call you to account in the hereafter. Now worship him. But other places in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقُتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْ رِزْقٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْعِمُونَ So first is ibadah, then makhluq. So there are two ways to come to ma'rifah. Number one is to think and ponder about the ni'am of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِنْ تُعْدُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا And you can never exhaust that. And number two are for those people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them to have this in their hearts. That they come to the conclusion that there is a Lord, Allah, and I must worship Him. Last night, a girl came into my office in Boston from Uzbekistan. Her ancestors were Muslims, then they converted to another religion. She came to me and she said, I just thought about God. There's, only, there's no way He can be more than one. I was like, subhanAllah. And she took shahada, alhamdulillah. So as I finish, because it's adhan and it's allowed to talk on the adhan for the sake of knowledge, so we'll make it quick. But, number, but I feel shy to do it, so we'll let him finish, inshallah. So the methodology of arriving to this proper understanding about Allah being Allah. I don't worship him for happiness, sadness. I worship him. I'm like the mailman, 24-7, 365, rain, sleet, snow, it don't matter. I'm handling my business. You can translate that for older people here. Well, the young. Comes through two ways. One is pondering on his creation, seeing his ni'm. And that's why it's commendable for Muslims, qusiru fil ard, to go and see things in this world that remind you of the greatness of Allah. Now you can do it at an IMAX theater. They have this cool thing about polar bears, man. Only where you, the only place your iman can go is if you watch that is up, yo. And the second is through active cognition, what's called ta'allum. And this is fard. Imam Shafi said that it's an obligation upon every Muslim to learn what they need to know to preserve their iman. Fatwa maqasidi, subhanAllah. But how in America do we go about learning? And this has been a very, I would say, a major struggle for many of us due to a number of reasons. One is to fanaticism. That wherever we go, there are different masharib. That wherever we go, there are different kind of groups with ideas about studies and learning. And this sheikh is bakwas and... This sheikh is good, and this sheikh is great, and this is a white convert, liberal Azhari, who's changing the deen, the whole nine yards. And, and that is irresponsible on the part of the du'at and the a'imma, because you undermine the community's ability to have any stability in a postmodern setting when religion is under siege. So number one, when we set out to learn, we should first and foremost set out to learn for the pleasure of God. That's it. And Imam Ibn Ta'ala Iskandari said, Man ashaqat nihayatuhu faqad ashaqat bidayatuhu. 
ومن علامات النجاح في النهاية الرجوع إلى الله في البداية. He said that a sign of a good ending is that you return to Allah in the beginning. And what does it mean when I say I'm learning for the sake of Allah? Al Hafiz Ibn Rajib Al Hanbali, Rahimahullah. He said that when you are learning for Allah, as he mentions the statement of Sidi Malik, Rahimahullah, there'll be certain signs. And that's not that people will like to hear you speak. This is not one of the signs that you're famous. I remember I was in Egypt, a young American Muslim came to me and said, I want to be famous like you. I said, Audhu Billah. I said, Is that why you came here to study? He said, Yeah. I said, Akhi, this is not, you know, lyrical lounge. This is not, you know, Total Request Live B. This is the deen of Allah. وَالْعِلْمُ سِرُّ بَيْنَ عَبْدِ وَرَبِّي And the Prophet said, Whoever seek knowledge for this dunya will not smell the fragrance of paradise. So number one is to understand, to be sincere. And that sincerity has signs. First and foremost is that the application goes to the subject first, not an object. We all begin with what? With what? In trans, trans, intransitive sentences. It's just me, man. I have to work on myself. That should be the etiquette of the student first and foremost. Not to neglect the people. Because then people, well, are you saying we should neglect the people? No, but we're saying you should not neglect yourself. And that's why Allah said, Save yourself first. Save yourself first. Worry about others later. And he said from that will come certain signs. Number one, an increase in good behavior. And first and foremost, after learning to please Allah and understand correctly Islam, we should work on our behavior. When Jibreel came to the Prophet and read the Quran to twice to him in the month of Ramadan, or any time in the month of Ramadan, the hadith of Bukhari says, my Shaykh, we're reading Al-Bukhari together. He said, look at this hadith, ma ajmal hadith. When he says that Jibreel will come to the Prophet and he will become more generous than Rih al-Mursala. He said, notice the correlation between the Prophet reading Quran and the increase in his generosity, as if to tell you that the more your knowledge increases, the better your behavior should become. If you are learning knowledge from anyone and you leave that hating people, hating the Muslims, this sheikh is bakwas, man. I'd rather learn Quran from Shah Khan than this sheikh. Understand that you have put something poisonous in your heart. But when you leave a halaqa inspired to worship Allah more, to serve creation, to be at the feet of the people who need assistance and help, and to feel pain at the misguidance of ma the masses of the people, then understand your knowledge has served you well. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, أَقْرَبُكُمْ إِلَيَّ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ The closest of you to me in the hereafter are those who have the best behavior. And Allah said, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ استعار بالأحروف. I can't even break it down in English, it's so incredible. But as if to say, if, the, if good behavior was a mountain, at the top would be Muhammad So, good character. Don't go to a Suhaib web weekend course and come back to your parents. Oh, you haram. Tear these pictures down. The meat is not zabiha. What kind of tea you drink it? Tea? Dang, tea? Yeah, I'm religious now. I'm a bully. Check me out. You're a punk, man. And that's real talk. But knowledge humbles you. Keeps you in the service of people. My teacher for 10 years who I lived with, who learned 14 qiraat from his sister, from the shanqit, he told me, every time you learn, if your behavior doesn't improve, be careful of hypocrisy. Be careful of hypocrisy. So first and foremost is not to save the ummah, save the world, yo, I'm the next Ibn Taymiyyah B, I'm the next Rabia Ra'i. You need to be the first jannati before you can be that. And to be a jannati, you got to work on yourself first and be real with yourself. And I struggle with that. We all struggle with that because we don't like to hear bad things about ourselves, especially when our time is up. 
And that requires effort. And my teacher used to tell me, بحر بسيط العلم كالغيث والأخلاق تربته إن تفسد الأرض تذهب نعمة المطر إبليس أعلم الأرض قاطبة والناس تلعنه في البدو والحضر الله. Used to tell me that knowledge is like rain and the soil is behavior. If the soil is corrupted, it doesn't matter how fresh the, the rain is. Iblis knows more than everyone, but people are cursing him from the city to the country. So it's not only the knowledge, it's the character that comes with the knowledge, the humility, the selflessness. The love, the concern. Listen to the statement of Imam Ahmed's student. When they ask him on his deathbed, what's the one thing you did that you can bank on in this dunya? He said, I never hurt my wife's feelings. Even though he's a scholar of hadith and he's an alim, behind closed doors, he lives it. He lives it. And look at Umm Darda. When Abu Darda died and she said to him, when he said to her, what's the one thing you want? She said, An fil jannah. That I can marry you in Jannah. That's the type of husband he was. At home. There was a scholar, I'm not going to say his name. When he died, his wife burned his books. She said he wasn't worthy of these books. Allah. Character. Good character. Number two is to work hard on the soul. Imam al muhasib he said, Ibtad. He said, stay away from excuses. Avoid anything that will cause you to make an excuse for yourself. And flee to what burdens you. Real talk. Flee to what disciplines you. I'm sure Sheikh Omar can tell you now, the new generation, if you try to get real Sheikh with them, they can't handle it, B. A brother came to me, took him a month to memorize Surah Al-A'la. I said, Akhi, I don't think this is your thing, man. I'm going to be real with you. I don't think it's your thing. I, I want to be a Hafiz. Brother, you're gonna, it's going to take you my, your, and your daddy's lifetime to do this. And he was like, you're so hard. It's not fair. I said, I'm real. I'm trying to tell you, work harder. And that's what he said. Imam Ali said, You will never achieve what you want until you leave what you desire. And you will never reach your goals until you have patience with what you hate. I don't have enough time, but this is a really serious topic. And I would encourage you to read a book that was translated by Imam Zaid Shakir, uh, by Imam al-Mahasibi, about the, the path of guidance. That is an incredible book, message, epistle to the seekers of guidance. Read that book. Because everything that we were about to drop now is found in there. An incredible text. I apologize. Time has been kept short. But salah is more important than any other man's words. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.